Hi, my name is Beth Hill and I work for Michigan's Multi-Tiered System of Support TA Center and it's my pleasure to introduce today's session, Using Data Analysis to Accelerate Student Outcomes. This is a group from Washington Middle School and country, Copper Country ISD. Today's description is data analysis is central to a quality MTSS framework that is supportive of all learners. The seventh grade team at Washington Middle School in Calumet has embraced this approach to address specific needs identified using their early warning indicators data. During this webinar, staff from Washington Middle School and Copper Country ISD will share the story of their implementation efforts aimed at accelerating learning outcomes for their seventh grade students in a pilot program called FLEX. And I'm going to let each of the members of the presentation team introduce themselves as they come up. Thank you. Hi, so I'm Lynette Bure, um, Multi-Tiered Systems of Support Coordinator and School Psychologist at the Copper Country ISD. I'm Sierra Bishop. I am an MTSS specialist at the CCISD, and I am Washington Middle School's MTSS coach. Hi, I'm Carmen Markham. I'm a school social worker at the Washington Middle School in Calumet, Michigan, and I'm also a, the data coach for our school. And I'm Joe Wassil, I'm the Washington Middle School principal. Yeah, so thanks for coming. There's our names, everybody. You can go to the next slide, Joel. Um, so uh, we thought we would start out kind of broadly today to give you some context, um, give you a little background history about the systems that we have up in the Copper Country ISD with uh, MTSS, some of the history with uh, Washington Middle School's journey with MTSS, and then we'll get into the meat of the presentation, which is Joel and Carmen talking about all the great work that they've been doing to help improve student outcomes. Uh, feel free to answer questions or ask questions along the way to um, interrupt us. We're fine with that. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Joel. <clears throat> so uh, we are the Copper Country ISD way up north uh, in the Upper Peninsula. We service Barriga, Houghton, and Keweenaw counties. We um, have been through the evolution of MTSS in Michigan. We started off with a my Blissey partnership when it first got started working with just elementary schools and as it evolved into my MTSS. Um, so we've been we've been in this business for a while. Um, eventually we've become pretty independent with um, having our own trainers and coaches and systems established here. Uh, we have an ISD MTSS team and it consists of myself as a coordinator, general ed and special administrators, we have school psychs, we have school social workers on it. Um, we have nine systems coaches um, and we have a big emphasis on implementation science. The more I have been in this business, I realize how important implementation science is. So we do a lot around teams. Teams are essential to the work, um, being selective about initiatives that we're choosing to embark on. Um, ongoing data analysis, all of those pieces of implementation science, making sure we're paying attention to um, uh, stages of implementation when we're trying something new. And you'll hear that um, in the background as Joel and Carmen talk about uh, when you're starting on something unique, being sure that um, it's addressing your needs and your piloting and paying attention to the data as you embark on it. So we have 20 teams that we are building level teams that we're working with at the ISD. Uh, 16 of those are building level teams. And then if we have all of the buildings in a district that are um, embarking on an MTSS adoption, then we also have district level teams established where we do a little heavier dive into the implementation science piece. So history with Calumet. When um, my Blissey first came around, the elementary school had um, been involved and they took off for it for a while. And then as we know, sometimes over time things uh, fade. So they're right now rebooting. They're doing a great job. They're getting their PBIS systems up and running again and reading systems. So they're doing a lot. Uh, 2018 and 19 Washington Middle School um, started on this journey. So uh, they're, 
uh, principal and school social worker at that time reached out. They were putting out a lot of fires behaviorally. So they said, hey, we need to get some systems in place here to, to try to improve our, our behavior outcomes. And so we started with the PBIS trainings. Uh, they took off with it. Um, their principal at the time said, if you need anyone to shout at, off the rooftops about how important this is and how it's changed my job, um, I'm your guy. But then he retired, right? And so um, the beauty of this work is that uh, once you get good teams established and good infrastructure established, then Joel and Carmen were able to just slip right in because that was the culture of how things were done at Washington Middle School. And not only did they um, have a seamless transition, but they became leaders in this area. And so, you know, they're some of our strongest um, MTSS uh, workers in this area right now. So um, you can go to the next slide, Joel. <clears throat> so uh, some of the supports as an ISD that we provide to our schools is uh, we have data reviews three times a year in the fall, winter, and spring. Um, all of those teams look at our fidelity data and our student outcome data. So we do, you know, the fidelity data, looking at what the adults are doing, what systems you have in place. So the PBIS and reading tiered fidelity inventories. And then we look at our student outcome data as well. At the middle school level, we're looking at early warning indicators, which looks at the attendance, behavior course proficiency. And then they're also tracking some office disciplinary referrals. Some of our schools are using Swiss, but Washington Middle School has a um, kind of a, a unique way to track that data too. Um, and then at those data reviews, they're looking at progress on goals, action plans. And, and uh, my favorite part, of the data reviews is at the end of every data review, we do a show and tell. So we have multiple schools looking at their data, developing goals and action plans, and then they share what they're working on. And if there's something that they've found has been really successful, they're sharing it with the other teams. If they have a, a common problem, let's say someone, you know, you have multiple schools looking at how to address attendance, then they can brainstorm with each other across districts. And so that's been a really, really positive uh, thing. So when we talk about um, those teams, we have coaches at each of those teams. So the ISC provides coaching. Um, they can talk with the, the teams. We get together, uh, all the coaches get together for a monthly coaches power hour. But a lot of that work falls on Sierra Bishop's shoulders. <laughs> she coaches many, many, many buildings. Uh, and so she's been doing a lot of the work with Washington Middle School going back you know, going through the trainings with them and then going back at the ranch and helping them to develop um, their system. So we'll let Sierra take it over. And I, I have to say, I've been lucky to coach Washington Middle. They've been a, a great uh, group to work with. So I, I, I am thankful for that. Um, they have been having their monthly meetings where they work on um, action items, focusing um, on their uh, achieving the fidelity and student outcome goals that they make uh, at the beginning of each year. Um, as Lynette said, they took off fast and furious at the uh, right from the beginning, and they were like, "Give us more! Give us more!" They want they wanted more training, so we provided um, that this long list of training that um, we went over or that have listed there, um, and that was in a short amount of time. And uh, during COVID and all these, they just were hungry to improve and and do better. They I have to say they were also set up already. They were doing. Uh, grade level teaming, but they just needed some more structure to it. They wanted ways to look at their data and um, kind of give give a more of a focus. So um, I think they had a lot of things that were already in place that really helped them um, move forward and start off with a great uh, success, I think. So Joel, you want to talk a little bit about your school? Yes, you'll have to forgive me. I am kind of going through a little cold here, so I'm a little nasally and, and might start coughing, but we're going to get through it. So um, our profile here at Washington Middle School is we have 262 students this year in sixth through eighth grade. Um, that does fluctuate. Uh, we've been up to 300 and, and this has actually been the, the lowest we've been. So it kind of goes up and down depending on, on, the, on the year. But our breakdown is pretty even between male, and female. We have about 50 percent. Um, we have 94% white, Hispanic, or Latino, we're about 2%, and multiracial, we're 4%. And that changes uh, year to year. Our free and reduced lunch is around 60%. Our Title I is 22%, special education is 13%, and 
And then our at-risk data that we really drill down is at 75.6%. So that's a little bit higher um, probably than a lot of schools that you see around. And so these are things that we want to put in place to make sure that we're, we're helping and serving all students. Um, we are the northernmost middle school, as you can see down in the corner down there. Um, Kelly, it's all the way up top. We are the the furthest up north you can get before falling in the, the big lake. Um, a fun fact is we actually get more inches of snow per year than we have students in middle school. We get about 300 inches of snow. And right now I'm looking out the window and seeing about a 20 foot snow bank where they plow into our, um, I would say a playground, but there's just a lot of snow and kids actually enjoy it. So um, that's kind of a rundown of our school and where we're at there. I'm going to turn it over to Carmen Markham and she's going to kind of go over identifying needs and other considerations. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Joel. Um, so what we wanted you to get a picture of is what our student body looks like. Um, we're not a huge school, but we've got, you know, a little under 300 students here. We're monitoring data on them all the time, right? So that's what that tiered system approach looks like. Um, where you're regularly collecting that early warning indicator data, um, reviewing it as a team, problem solving around it, developing goals. Um, so through that process, um, we were able to identify a need that we weren't um, meeting prior to that point in the school year. So we had a couple of marking periods of data that was showing that we had a student a student group that was struggling pretty significantly. Um, these were a group of seventh grade students. Um, and again, because our population doesn't hit 300, we're able to look at things on a, a deeper level than just what we're reporting on for early warning indicators. So we're looking at behavior that's on a deeper level than just suspensions and expulsions. Um, we're looking at academic progress that's on a deeper level than course proficiency only. Of, co of course, we're looking at those things, but we wanna go a layer or two deeper always. So um, we had some good information about this group um, that we were able to identify um, and kind of clearly see what they were struggling with um, and started to do some problem solving around that. Thinking about what we would like to do, what do we wanna see happen? How can we make that happen? So it was lots of conversation that we had. So while we were, and th this is also when we look at this, we're looking at the, the accelerated model, right? The Michigan accelerated model and and kind of saying, how can we help these students? Uh, me and Carmen, I'm new this year. And Carmen's Carmen's been around here for three years, three years. Mm -hmm. So we kind of looked at this this group and said, how can we how can we help these students stay at grade level and 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 push forward? And, and there's a lot of data. And that's when we also reached out to MTSS team um, and, and talked to Sierra and Lynette and said, OK, there, what can we dig into a little bit further? Um, to help these students stay at grade level and move forward with the seventh grade curriculum. And that was a big part of this too, I think. Right. Yeah. Especially because the group that we had identified was about 10% of that grade. No one wants to see 10% of the grade not move on. Right. That's not, we're just not going to do that. And so we needed to figure out a way of how can we keep those expectations high but support them in scaffolding some of the skills that they might be missing, um, supporting them in a different way. So lots of conversations rolling around with ideas, problem solving, going back to the table, getting feedback, saying we don't think this will work or this we should weave in this component or that component. There's lots of discussion. Um, and a lot of this was is, is very unique. We, we did a lot of things, especially coming in as a new principal, there's a lot of things we did in small pockets, but this MTSS and 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 our hexagon tool, as we looked at what we need to do um, and how we need to bring all these little pockets together and, and make sure that we're, we're doing this with fidelity, right? So all these little tutoring groups we're doing or after school groups that we're doing, we looked at our hexagon tool and said, okay, how can we look at something like a flex lab to keep kids where they're at, at grade level in that accelerated model, and then make sure that we're meeting them and, and, and pushing them forward. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think this MTSS, all this data really brought all that stuff together and, and really shined a light on. We have a lot of great things going on, but they're kind of separated. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, I, think, I think we got more coherence in our efforts of how we were gonna tackle this. But then also like just that piece of, that's the beauty of 
doing that um, data collection and review on a regular basis. You can't ignore a glaring problem like this, right? Put your head in the sand and say 10% of the grade isn't doing well. Well, let's forget about that and focus on only the good things. Um, of course, it's important to be positive, but it really gives you um, very pointed things to be thinking about and problem solving around. So that kind of gives you some, some background on all of that. Um, but so to, to go a little deeper into how this fits when you're thinking about the hexagon tool in particular is clearly we're, we're talking to you about how we demonstrated that there was a need. We had a need there. We knew that there was a big group in the seventh grade that was struggling. Um, we had over 10% of them failing two or more classes. Um, they only are enrolled in five classes, um, four core classes and one class that we call an encore class, which are special topics. Um, things like gym, health, computer STEM related classes, those types of things. So four, cl four core classes plus one additional special focus class. Um, we knew that this intervention was aligned with our current initiatives and our MTSS goals for the school. You know, that was clear to us. So we identified that it was a good fit um, when you're thinking through those hexagon tool components. Um, we also knew that supported study halls were effective. There's evidence of effectiveness broadly, you know, in that approach, but then also we had had pocketed experiences with that. Our special education students are in supported study hall settings. That works really well for us. We had a, <clears throat> a couple of really small group sixth grade supported study hall um, experiences last year. So take this group that we have in Flex Lab and reduce it you know, to about 30%. We saw success there. Um, Joel, who was previously an administrator out at our alternative high school, had some experience with supported study halls being effective there too. So Yeah, and they, were, they became some actually a focal point up at Horizons because we, we, we found out that you, you work with this flex lab and you are allowed to keep kids at their level instead of retaining them in sixth grade or seventh grade or eighth grade. You're allowed to continue to give access to that student at grade level but then help them with grade level content and a separate hour. So you, you get that hour and 10 minutes or hour and 20 minutes and that 20 minutes extra is, is a focal point. Um, so they can, if they're, if they're doing the Pythagorean theorem, they can go back and work on the Pythagorean theorem and get help on the independent parts of that. And I'm not even a math teacher, but I did pull up Pythagorean theorem pretty quick. <laughs> we think it's the one math term he remembers well. So it's the one he uses often yes. in examples, but um, anyway, so we had we had those components in place. Um, then we just were in such a fortunate position this year. It doesn't always happen, right? Where everything lines up at the right time. But we had um, we had a staff member that was going to have some openings in their teaching schedule for the second half of the year. Well, what was our data telling us in the first half of the year that we had this group that was struggling, not just in marking period one, but in marking period two. Um, so we were able to capitalize on this capacity and support that we already had in existence in the building. We didn't have to do all kinds of magic work to try to figure out who could take this on. How do we fit that in? How do we budget that item, um, this new kind of intervention, the time that staff would be spending, the space we can make it happen, and all of those things that you have to think through. It just was beautiful timing for us. Um, so we were able to really capitalize on that. And I want to give her a quick shout out because she's yeah. done amazing. Liz Leach, um, she's she's a reading specialist. She's just been absolutely amazing with us. Been able to just kind of jump in and and pilot a program that we didn't really know if it was going to work or not. And and she is just, and you're going to see in our data later that it's been amazing what she has done with this, mm -hmm. with this small group of kids. And, and it actually has driven us to push this school-wide. Yeah, so we'll talk a little bit more about that, what we're looking at down the road. Um, but so, yeah, we were able to hit on that capacity and supports. They were already in existence. Um, we didn't have to do any finagling to make that happen. And so, especially because we were looking at a pilot version, not something broad. Um, and we had an identified group that we were um, ready to run with. So we'll talk with you a little bit about um, 
how we worked through deciding who was going to participate in the intervention from from the get-go. So, so let's move on to identify. How did we identify these students? Um, and everybody says move it, Joel. But once again, I, I'm I'm actually these girls are the ones who do all the work. When she said, "Can you move a slide, Joel?" It's actually Carmen. So I get the one I get the name, but these these ladies are doing all the work. So um, I want to let her tell you how she identifies these um, or the team identifies yeah. the people are going to participate. Yeah. So as the data coach, in addition to my responsibility as a school social worker this is part of what I'm looking at all the time, right? At least on a monthly basis, but more often than that, really. Um, and because we're a relatively small school, I'm interested in um, those deeper details that are involved with what's going on with these students, trying to get a good picture of, is there something else that we need to be paying attention to or are there patterns that, um, where there's some overlap between student needs that we can try to meet in some way. So um, we're going to just kind of talk you through the process that we used. Um, and please feel free to ask questions if you have them about how we, how we went about identifying students to get into this pilot program. Um, so initially, what we want you to know is, again, we're tracking that behavior, um, behavior data on suspensions and expulsions. But we garnered deeper data um, on students that were struggling in the seventh grade. I'll talk with you a little bit about that. We were looking at their attendance. Um, are they getting to school regularly? And we identified a group that was failing two or more classes in the seventh grade. So when you kind of look through our process, what we would want you to know is students that were um, struggling primarily in math, we we assigned them a math specific intervention. We didn't consider them for this. We really were trying to reserve spots in this intervention for a different type of student that had a greater need than just math. So we've got something called Math Lab. Um, we kind of stuck with that type of name, naming system for this, which we call Flex Lab. They happen at the same time. So um, students that were struggling primarily in math, they got assigned a Math Lab. That was where they went. Um, then we started off with um, the clear-cut candidates for us were going to be students that were um, basically we gave priority placement to students that were failing three or more classes and the students that were failing three or more classes were failing three or four of the core courses they weren't we weren't even factoring in um, that on core class that's the special class um, they really were the ones that were 75% of their core courses they were failing. So we had kind of a group. We weren't even going to look beyond that. They, they did have attendance concerns. Um, you'll see kind of collectively what our data looked like for this group that came in. They did have attendance concerns, but we just, it was like priority placement. Let's move you in. Then we knew we had some capacity to serve students beyond just that group. So we started doing some triaging who, again, who has attendance concerns, who has behavior concerns. We, um, we didn't have enough um, suspension or expulsion data on these students to say that would be the clear indicator to get them in. So we looked deeper than that. What are the behaviors that we see, you know, school-wide for just office discipline referrals, but also talking to the teachers. Okay, these are a list of candidates. What are the, how would you describe their in-classroom behaviors? So then we started looking at markers for, um, I've got, you know, kind of a list here that describes a few of the students that ended up in, in Flex Lab. Um, one of them had discipline concerns, so we were getting office discipline referrals, but they were also tardy often, um, and they lacked organization. So several of their teachers said they don't, they're not organized with their stuff, they don't take it with them, they, um, they have trouble finding things. Another one of the students um, would be described as being distracted in class all the time, arriving unprepared for class hours, having to go back to their locker, or asking to go back to their locker, and maybe not even being allowed to, but not showing up with what they needed, um, not being on task during the class hour, um, and forgetting to turn materials in. It's like, okay, some concerns about behavior with that student. Um, we had another student that they described as having low motivation. They don't seem to care all that much about school. 
So tell us more about that student. Um, they said they don't seem very connected with, um, with kids in their grade. They don't seem very connected with adults in the building. Um, and so we kind of identified no strong social ties either. So not just lack of connection, um, but a little bit deeper than that. No strong social ties even outside of the classrooms that they were in hour by hour. Um, so we kind of had a good picture of here's what these candidates look like in and outside the classroom. Here's what the data is telling us about them. And that helped us do some problem solving or triaging about, all right, ultimately, who's getting in? And so we identified um, a list of eight students that we felt like would be the best candidates that had the greatest need. And then we we developed what I called the watch list. So all of this was in really good communication with the seventh grade team, um, doing lots of problem solving directly with them, identifying with them, and then um, being able to have a watch list ready to go. The reason why we went with a watch list kind of a model, um, and that's just what I call it, is because we didn't want to forget about these other students we had spent so much time talking about and saying, oh, yeah, we've got some concerns about this. We've got some concerns about that. But they didn't kind of rise to the highest level of that triaging process. And we didn't want to water down the intervention so much that it wasn't effective. Right, Joel? We spent a lot of time talking about how many students do we think we could really adequately serve in this type of a model. And you're going to hear a lot more about what the process looks like. And that'll give you some idea of why. Why couldn't you do this with 20 students at a time, right? Um, and so, especially with the staff member that was going to be leading this initiative, Liz Leach, she gave us a lot of feedback. She does some small group intervention stuff for us already. That really gave us a good feel for, we felt like eight was a magic number to start with. Um, and the watch list allowed us to not forget about these other students that we've identified, but they just don't quite rise to the level of where they're going to get priority placement in this initiative right away. Um, the great thing about that is because we had that established and we were kind of monitoring, monitoring that watch list, those watch list students, monitoring how things were going, um, as we'll talk with you about what, what, were, what were we seeing happen. Um, that allowed us to roll in two more students after, after one marking period of um, using this intervention model, right? Yep. So we felt like, okay, we've got the capacity to add two more in. The other thing about that um, watch list kind of process is that if we would have had a student leave the district, or if we would have had a student move to online, or if we would have had a student kind of graduate out of this intervention. They did so well and really kind of developed some, you know, solid skills and how to really tackle school effectively. We would roll them out of the intervention that would leave space for somebody new to come in, right? So having kind of that list ready to go and having us keep a close eye on them so that we could go, okay, as soon as we're able, we want to get you in. Um, that allowed us to add two more because we felt like with good experience in the first marking period of rolling this out, she thought she could expand to 10 students. And so that's what we went with, right? Yeah. So that kind of talks <clears throat> you through um, all of that. And we'll kind of move on to the uh, description of Flex Lab. What does our Flex Lab actually look like? So we're going to start with the students because that is the most important part. We're focusing on students and trying to keep them in that accelerated model, trying to make sure that they continue at grade level um, as we move forward. So the first thing they do is we set up our Skywards. So at the beginning of the hour, they students go in and open their Skyward on their computer. And at the top of their Skyward, they have a little area at the top. It says all of the st stuff they're missing, all the assignments. So they can click on those assignments. We also use a learning management system called um, or student management and a learning management system, right? Our LMS is Schoology. And so all of our homework is on Schoology. So they can actually print right to a printer. And we have a printer on that floor um, so students can get access to those. So the idea would be they'd open their Chromebooks, go on Skyward, look at what they're missing, go to Schoology, print that off, and start working on assignments. Um, <clears throat> 
if they have all their assignments done, we would then look at the failing grades and we consider D minus and lower to be failing through our MTSS data um, because that D minus is really on that ver on, on that edge. So we want to get them to the D, the more solid ground. And so what we did is said anything that's D minus or better or, or under, you will have to redo. And we're kind of working on what that redo looks like. But right now what we have is if assignment is under that D minus, the student will redo it. Um, and they have to get 100% to get an 80% in the grade book and a 90% on the redo to get a 70% in the grade book. And that'll change as, as time goes on. But the idea that the student takes ownership in their work, but also the most important thing isn't the grade. The most important thing is the students understanding the material and, and going through that learning process and making sure they understand what's going on in class um, so they continue at grade level. Um, students are able to actually move about the floor, which was really neat because this is um, where we had our social studies teacher at this time is actually a study hall, but our math teacher, science teacher, and ELA teacher are on that floor. And, and to give you an uh, idea of, we have three floors. Our top floor is a sixth grade floor, middle floor is a seventh grade floor, and the bottom floor is the eighth grade floor. So there's not a lot of interaction. So that's kind of neat. So mm -hmm. when the students having trouble in science, they were able to actually go and talk to the science teacher. When they have trouble with English, they go talk to the English teacher. And this is a big part is that teacher buying, and we'll talk about that, the barriers of this program later on. But the teachers at this grade level were able to buy in and say, okay, yeah, I'll help them individually or help them go through some stuff. Also, they were able to get immediate feedback. They'd bring the homework down and they'd, it, they'd get a grade pretty much immediately, especially if it's a multiple choice or a short answer, um, so they could see what they're doing. And that that immediate feedback really does help for those struggling students, right? To see that, okay, I just did this assignment. This is where I'm struggling. I can go back and really look at it. And then it reinforces that educational process. It reinforces the effort. It, it just shows them that there's a connection there and a care there. Um, also, we use this time for makeup tests and quizzes. Um, so that was really beneficial mm -hmm. to a lot of students, especially because these students that are a little bit more disconnected with, with not being here, uh, they do miss a lot. And so they could go through their homework and then say, okay, at the end of their homework, they can jump into that test or quiz, get that complete, and then it's fresh in their mind. Um, we do have incentives for this program. Uh, and that I think that's the biggest part is we are incentivizing these students. So if you are caught up and you're getting a D or, or, or higher in all classes, remember, it's a D, we're not saying A's, we're not seeing B's. A lot of these students, we start off with 20% and 30% in the classroom. Um, so getting them to a 65% was really important and it's really good for them. A lot of them have failed to uh, failed, um, classes in sixth grade or in fifth grade, right? So getting them to that level, um, of a D and then say, you know what, you can go in our maker space and a maker space basically includes our computers, 3d printers, laser engravers. There's a lot of really neat things. We've been very fortunate, uh, porch health foundation and, um, rupees. And I mean, we've, we've had people donate, um, a lot of money to our school to be able to set these labs up. Um, and we have some awesome teachers that work with all this stuff, right? And then we have a student lounge um, where a student can go and sit and read. And you can see from the pictures that there's a little tail and you can see that uh, there's a little tail there. We have a therapy dog. We have two therapy dogs actually kind of roam around school. So when they go in these student lounge areas, the dogs are kind of in and out. So students use it to simply decompress if they're having a bad day or or they can play some strategy games. Um, there's no electronics in these in these uh, student lounges. You're not you're not there to, to sit on a computer and and watch YouTube or whatever. There is some music playing in the background here and there, um, depending on what Mrs. Leach puts going. But overall, it's it's about getting kids to kind of decompress and get back into a good book or a strategy game and, and kind of get them out of that um, maybe stress mode. Or, or give them that reward, right? Um, so if we move on to, I guess I can do that. Sorry, Carmen. That's okay. I will throw everything on Carmen. She does so much for us here that I kind of just throw everything on her. And you can see from the um, top pictures up there, this is our Flex Lab. Um, and, and we took it to the extreme for this pilot program. Well, we didn't. Uh, Miss Leach took it to the extreme, mm -hmm. right? She, she has comfortable seating. She has lights on in the background, right? This isn't our typical classroom, um, but it definitely is a reflection of, the way we're going to go in the future. Um, and you can see the dog actually is laying there as, as a student's uh, presenting. Um, so that's kind of neat. But what, what we did here is we talked about the teacher last because once again, this is a student first initiative. This is all about the student. And the teacher is there, but the teacher is not your traditional stand up um, 
and and lecture or move through PowerPoints. Your teacher is there to coach, it's, it's there to help. And, and Liz really made this clear. And these are Liz's, Liz or Mrs. Leach's uh, list of what goes on in there. Um, so she always starts with a good thing. We're uh, uh, capturing kids' heart mm -hmm. school, uh, Vern Hazard and, and the Porch Health Foundation and um, Flip Flip. And it, it's been a great program. And, and I can see the ladies are smiling as it's been an amazing program to um, go through. But we are capturing kids' hearts. So we start with something good, start in that positive. Um, get kids into that mode. Then the student self identifies where they want to go for that hour. So they pick what class they want to work on. They pick up what homework they want to work on, what project they want to work on. Now the teacher does have the power to override that because sometimes there's a test coming up that we really need to get these four assignments done. Or maybe it's the end of the marking period and that it, realistically the, the teacher might say, okay, we can get through these three classes. That fourth class, you know, we're, we're going to leave that alone, but we're going to get through these three things. So the teacher has the ability to you know, one of the things that I think really is happening there, Joel, and we've spent some time talking about this, is that those students are learning that prioritization skill through that process. They get to do some decision making and they feel um, like they've got ownership in how they spend their time. But then they get some coaching from Liz when she thinks that maybe this other piece would be more important. It's actually going to impact your grade more. So let's put that aside and let's have you either... Um, tackle this test that's really weighing down your grade or redo this big assignment um, that you can, you know, really improve your grade significantly by doing that. So it's, it really is like a prioritization skill that she's teaching them through that coaching process. You decide what supplies do you need? Okay, I'm gonna give you some feedback on that when they go through that. Um, because they do some conferencing. Did you yeah. talk about no, that? No, I haven't. Okay. We'll, we'll get to that so, next, right? So what we're going to do here is we do have a mini lesson. I want to bring this up too. We have that mini math lesson because when we did do this, yeah. we, we looked at that math lab and we did find out that kids were struggling in the math lab area in, in math. So we do have some mini lessons in math. And I, I think that could switch. And I know that can switch. Yes. You know, if we find out science or, or social studies in the area, we'll have some mini lessons um, to make sure that these kids are getting that background knowledge to stay at that grade level. Yeah, that's that really is the idea behind why. Why, why do we have three days of mini lessons in math in Flex Lab? Um, it's because we knew we were actually pulling some students from that other intervention, the math lab intervention specifically, that they were already rolled into or could have been identified for. So we knew they were going to miss that math specific content, revisiting that, reteaching, really getting them, um, getting their feet under them with the grade level, um, seventh grade level content math. And so we didn't want to lose that entirely, right? But we knew, we spent a lot of time talking about could they go back and forth? Could they go to math lab some days and go to flex lab other days? We really felt like that would water down their flex lab, the effectiveness of flex lab for them. And it would water down the pilot, right? We wanted yeah. some realistic feedback if we're going to take this initiative. During during this time, like the students are working, the teacher, once again, we talked about the teachers, kind of that that <clears throat> support, that coach, they're, they're not up front, right? And so during the time that the students are working, she's there actually having many conferences, maybe on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, to help out and say, okay, what are we going to plan on for this week? What's going on next week? And really work on their planning and that planning skill, because we want to make sure that at seventh grade and at sixth grade that we, we teach these skills prior to uh, the, the planning going forward and, 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 and how to make sure that students learn these very important skills. Um, so that is there. Um, nothing. The, the cool thing is the seventh grade team agreed that nothing will be closed for nine weeks, yeah. um, which flew in the face of what, you know, they yeah. originally were doing. If they were behind, you know, if the, that assignment was a week old or had been done, completed a couple weeks ago, it was a different mentality, right? Like that's closed. We're over and done with that. Let's just have these students move on. And, and it took some really, you know, spending some time talking about it. Well, what do we really want these students to get out of this process? Um, and I think that the biggest thing is, I, I think yeah. what, what one of the teachers over is be able to say, are, when we close the, the, these assignments and they can't redo them or they get docked for them, are we also telling the students, well, that information is no longer important because it's gone, it's gone. Um, and so I'll get to you one second, Tierra, I see you raising your hand, I know we have a question. So that was very important for us to say that no, that information is still important and we still need to go over it and we still need to um, make sure that the student understands it. Sierra, you have a question for us. Yeah, um, somebody had asked, going along with your, your grading practices and your um, 
uh, closing assignments and things. It, the question was, is your school using any research-based grading practices like 50% is an F instead of zero to 59.4% uh, or standard-based grading on a four-point scale? So what kind of, what are your grading practices? that? So that's a great question. Our, our grading is zero to 59. It's your standard zero to 59.4. Um, you, you end up with an E um, and then it, it goes up from there. However, we are looking at um, with our superintendent's um, blessing. We are looking at that's the other thing we haven't mentioned. Our superintendent is, is amazing. Chris Davidson, um, he lets us do a lot of crazy stuff. Right. And, <laughs> and do these kind of things. So we want to make sure that Chris Davidson, he's not on, but he is definitely amazing. He's done some amazing stuff, allowed us to do these types of things. And he's actually allowing us with our board um, to say, OK, how can we look at some of those um, grades and, 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 and how can we manipulate that a little bit? I know they've had some discussion about some competencies. Can we move? To that competency report card but for right now this is where we're at and and we are looking at that for the future so that is a great question um and then once again if we we look at some of the big tests or big ideas big tests big things coming up on fridays um because naturally i think teachers give those quizzes and tests on fridays right mm -hmm. um and so a lot of times we look at the teacher Ms. mrs leach looks at okay after these mini conferences, we prepare for all this stuff. These big tests are coming up typically on Fridays. She'll play some relaxing music, have some good things, do some other stuff, and then she'll go into the test. And then right after the test, we have some good reinforcements, and, and they celebrate that. They celebrate the, the completion of that test. And it, we don't celebrate we don't celebrate an A, B, C, or D, or, or you know, E. I don't know why you celebrate an E, but we celebrate the process. We celebrate the you worked through this. You got through this. Let's celebrate that. If we miss something, we'll go back and we'll fix it. No big deal, right? We can redo that test, right? So not a big deal there. Um, we also have, go ahead. The other thing that I think, because we didn't get to dive into this while you tackled that question, but um, Joel and I have spent a lot of time talking about um, seeing students' motivation tank at some point in the semester where they feel like there's no chance of recovery, right? That's another reason why we were really um, hopeful about getting buy-in for that. Nothing in the grade book is closed model because, man, we just lose them um, motivation-wise. If they're like, there's no way for me to recover, why, why bother trying anymore, right? No matter how much you reinforce that, well, anything you learn for the remainder of the semester is helpful. And we want you to get some of this content and um, those types of pep talks you can give them when they feel like there's no climbing out of that hole, um, it's tough to get them. And it's daunting into, for any of us, yes. right? It's daunting for every, any of Adults us. Adults too. And you come here today, I'm feeling a little bit under the weather. Um, <clears throat> I know I got this presentation. It's a daunting thing to get up and be like, all right, I got to get here. I got to get this done. I'm going to be here till six, seven o'clock tonight working on That's daunting for an adult. Can you imagine that for, for a 13 year old or a 12 year old? Mm -hmm. Well, you're four weeks behind. What does that mean? That means that they they feel they can't move forward. They feel that they feel that weight of all that homework and all that stress, and and people are probably getting down on them. Now it's like oh, I'm three weeks behind, but I'm going to really work. I'm going to really get caught up. And we've seen students actually stay caught up. It's kind of weird. Is we said you can go back and do all the stuff. We didn't see kids take advantage of that part. They're staying caught up in this flex lab. They're staying on task. They're staying. So it's it's a really unique when you we allowed them to open up and go back. They used it to get caught initially, up yeah. initially in, mark, in the first marking yeah. period of the. But now, but now they're not they're needing not to as so, often because they think they're feeling better. Right? And the other thing I think is very important in, in, in talking in the MTSS and the data is we still do have tier one interventions. This doesn't replace any. We, we still go with the tier one interventions. This this hasn't replaced anything. This is this is a, a, a good a good start for us. But we do have weekly homework sheets. We do have progress reports. And the cool thing is, actually, um, Kelly Budwig, our English teacher, brought this to one of us. And, and our, our superintendent was, that's a great idea. Why don't we do it? As every Friday, the teacher or the students mm -hmm. in sixth, seventh, and eighth take ownership in their grades. And they do that by looking at Skyward, downloading, taking a screenshot, yep. and sending it home to their guardian. And then saying, this is what I got to work on. This is what I get, did good on. They CC the teacher. Mm -hmm. and send it to the parent and they get extra credit if the parent responds back mm -hmm. so now the student is taking ownership the parent is taking ownership 
And a lot of that onus is now put back on that, that dynamic. And it's taken a, a little bit of weight off the teachers. Okay, you have to do this. And this is this has been a, a school-wide initiative. And it's it's really been amazing. And Kelly Budwig, our English teacher, she's a first-year teacher here too. Yes. So mm -hmm. thanks to the MTSS team, you talked about the process. And everybody, it's crazy how it, it keeps going. You have another Sarah's question there, Sierra. Questions. Yep, somebody was wondering, um, how did you make the core teachers available during that hour? Um, do, you, do you have to change your school schedule? Um, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get to that a little bit later, but... Well, we, no, you should answer okay, it now. I'll, okay, I'll answer it now. Um, yeah. So it's a very unique, we have we have an amazing staff here, and this is during their prep hour. Um, yeah. So yes, I know some of you are going to be like, oh, I can't do that. No way. Um, there's contractual things. There's, but I'm telling you what, they're amazing. And it's not every day, right? But teachers... And it's not all, 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 all hour long no. yeah, that they're it's... having to answer questions and be a resource. And yeah. yeah. So they, they saw the data. They saw our MTSS data and they said, how can we help? And we continue to go over that data. And we also then said, we want that accelerated model that the MDE is putting out. We want to keep kids at grade level. And they're like, okay, how can we do this? And we were like, well, could you give up some of your prep time here and there? Um, and we don't, I don't even think we said prep time. Yeah. We just said, this is a flex lab. And kids started kind of kind of going in and, and, and then teachers just kind of jumped in and did it. Next year, it'll be different. I think an important thing um, for whoever that person was that asked that question to know is that our core teachers on each grade level have two prep hours a day. So they have two common times where all of them are available at the same time. Um, and it's not like we have a sixth grade teacher that at some point in the day covers in the seventh grade or jumps into the eighth grade or an eighth grade teacher that, you know, flip flops through different floors to cover teaching time. So we're just incredibly fortunate that already built into the system, they have those two hours of the day where all core teachers are available. So we didn't, we did not have to do any rescheduling. It's a great question because I'm sure for some of you that feels daunting to even think about how you would get good overlap there. Um, but then also that idea that Joel was talking about the piece of um, how do you get them to buy into utilizing that time a little differently where it's not just your prep time um, separate from students, but that you're, you kind of have an open door policy where you're allowing them to come in and out while you're still using that prep time and, and for a, yourself. A big thing I think also is they, they've, they're starting to reap the benefits of this. Remember a student that's falling behind is going to communicate to you that they need help. And that communication is typically through discipline and discipline issues within the classroom or, or the classroom setting or the hallway setting or lunchroom setting. Right. So now we have 10 more students in that group that we're falling behind. We have the special education students that are getting good access and, and a lot of help. We have the, the 10 students that are falling behind, you know, so we now have a, a good solid group of students that are caught up. So those discipline issues within class have kind of dissipated. We're, I looked this morning. <laughs> okay. 142% decrease in discipline referrals. This from, from the first three months till now. Now, there's a lot of things that go on there. Like, there's a lot of things that go on there. But that's pretty amazing. Yeah. That's really amazing. Yeah. And it's not all this, but it, it's a good part of that. And, you know, um, we're kind of already, we're diving a little bit into the results yeah, idea. Um, so I guess we can, we can move to that yeah, let's slide. Let's move to that slide. It's the next slide anyway. Okay. Um, but one thing that we are having students, not students, teachers report out about is that, um their conversations with these students when they're coming in during that prep hour um, or different points of the day, maybe even when they're in their core class are just more positive and constructive, right? These teachers are starting to believe that these students care about school because they're coming back to them and saying, can I, I'd like to redo this assignment or I, I would like you to reopen this. So I'm asking good questions. And all of those types of exchanges that they're having are really communicating to these teachers, hey, these students care. Um, where I would be willing to bet you, we didn't survey these teachers beforehand about what they thought about <laughs> um, students' beliefs about school at the beginning of this. It would have been a good piece of data to collect, but I think they would have said for the most part that this group, they don't care. And some of them said they have low motivation, right? They identified that as an in-classroom behavior that they're seeing. But I think a lot of them would have said they don't care about school. 
They just don't. But now they're finding in those conversations that they're having, they do. Yeah. And they it's do also care. pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, we have, you have the two by 10, right? That, that's, that's what we, we look at for some of our students, but it naturally al allows for that two by 10, right? Where you, you have that, you'd I'm have saying to, that right, right? You'd have to explain what the two by 10 oh, is. So, because so basically um, you're having those, those conversations about what's going on outside of school. Like how was your weekend or, Okay. Go ahead. So two by 10 is a relationship building strategy. Um, it's something kind of on our list of lots of, you know, things you could pull out to try to draw a student in and build a relationship with them. Right. So it's, it's one of the things that we have. So then you can talk more okay. about it. So, so that's it's a relationship why, building that's strategy. That's why I have her because she can do all those. Mm -hmm. She can describe all those amazing things. I just, she just tells me what to do. So they're ha having these conversations about the weekend and, and, and about what's going on or maybe about a sporting event. And that's naturally building communicate or building a connection with that student. And once you build that connection with that student, that student is less apt to disappoint, right? They want to make sure that they're helping you out and they're 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 keeping that expectation high, right? And it's 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 showing that it's it's showing some empathy, right? You have empathy for them. You you understand what they're going through, and and they receive that, right? I, I was actually watching a podcast a couple of days ago. Um, a study done by Harvard University, and it was about sales, um, which sometimes education is about sales, right? You're trying to sell your stuff out there. But the biggest thing was empathy. Okay. Right? To get them in, pull them in, is the best salesperson never sells their product. They come in and say, they, how are you doing? They express empathy. What are you doing? They express that empathy. And, and that two by 10 is that's what we're doing. You're never selling your product. You're never selling your education. You're making a connection. And once you have that connection, that student's going to follow you. That student's going to respect and, and, and follow those rules. And you also inherently will respect and, and, and probably help them out a little bit more. So I'm sorry I hijacked that. I'm going to let you go on to your uh, results. <laughs> okay. So we want to talk with you a little bit about what are we seeing as outcomes? Again, just keep in mind, please, this is a pilot group. So initially, it's only eight students data that we're looking at. Now, just in marking period four, we've rolled two more in, so we've got 10 students total. So keep that in mind, because as one student starts to soar, um, it impacts the data pretty significantly. As a student <clears throat> drops off or runs into some difficulty, that impacts the data significantly. Um, but we looked at end of marking period three data so that it's a kind of open, closed um, not fluctuating data points. We were monitoring it over the course of the marking period, but the data we're showing you right now is almost entirely um, full marking period results. So um, this group had almost a 20% rate of missing school. Um, that was through marking period one and marking period two collectively. So we knew that they were missing school about 20% of the time. Some of the students in this pilot group were missing it tremendously more than that. Um, you would cringe if you saw um, saw some of that data. And then a couple of them weren't missing school nearly as often, but they were still really doing poorly um, in school with academic progress. But collectively as a group, so that's just how we looked at it because it's just eight students, right? They were missing school about 20% of the time. So we had 75% of those par participants improve their attendance. Um, how much did they improve it? Well, I gave you that data. Collectively as a group, they improved their attendance by about 8% over that marking period. So we are at 20. They were missing school about 20% of the time. They improved it collectively as a group by about 8%, just a little over 8%. So we're getting them closer to that 10% mark of only missing school 10% of the time, right? Which is one of those early warning indicators that we're reporting on, on our MTSS data, where students, 90% of our students are here 90% of the time. So we're really trying to lift this group up in terms of being here more often. And some of that has to do with that culture and that process that's built into this Flex Lab design and the conversations that she's having with them um, about you've got to get here. We need you here. Um, and the community that they're developing as this small group about supporting each other. Um, and you can't see real big pictures of it in um, the slides that we have photos represented of that room, but they're, they're sitting in a, a, a circle 
in that room. So all of the desks are positioned in a circle with some soft spaces and alternative seating in other various areas, tables where students can work collectively together. But there's something really neat about that circular format where they're in this together, right? Even if they're doing individual things, um, there's, there's some collective kind of spirit, I think, going on in that room. Um, if we want to look at academic progress, um, I included math and ELA proficiency first because that's the early warning indicator again that we're early warning data that we're looking at. How are they doing passing language arts and math? Um, so this group was at 25% math and ELA proficiency <clears throat> before getting into this intervention and that um, kind of flourished to 66.7%. So huge improvement there with, with those two classes in particular, even though we didn't ask um, Mrs. Leach to focus specifically on, like, you got to bring those two up. We just, yeah. we wanted them to have improvement and success in anything and everything they could, right? Um, so I think to be, to be clear, though, we, we didn't even tell her, we've never told her that the expectation is to bring their grades up. No, you're we, right. We never said the expectation. We didn't set an expectation. We didn't say. Yeah, we, true. we never did. I, true. I, you know, we, we just said this is a great idea. We see some. Well, you want to give it a shot. She never even asked us what it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, with all that stuff going on in the MTSS results, I, I think we kind of knew, but we never set what just think about this. We never set a goal for we want this. We want this. We want mm -hmm. this. It was a true pilot. Like, what can we do? With yeah. So what are we going to see happen with this? Right. Um. So. But moving beyond just math and um, ELA proficiency, um, we saw that the average number of course grades improved per student, remember they're only enrolled in five, was 2.9. So just under three um, grades that they, different class grades that they brought up. 55.6% um, of the participants passed all of their classes um, in the last marking period. So remember, the largest group in this pilot were failing three out of their four courses. So to have 55.6% of them passing everything and, um, and great grades. I mean, they're not just like barely squeaking by. So in some classes, they are. But some of them went just like entirely in the other direction. Yeah. A's and B's, A's, B's, and C's. And, and just walking through the hallways, you know, and obviously it's a pilot, so we, we kind of spend a little bit more time. We had a couple individuals come through, and, and these individuals, um, some, you know, they, they're long hair, and they were kind of down, they, they would kind of mope through the hallways. And, and over the last three weeks, especially after we've talked to them a little bit, but, you know, I'm getting fist bumps from these kids a little bit more often. I'm getting, you know, it's not like, wow, we changed their whole life, right? But you can see that they're a little bit more happy. They're a little bit more upbeat. They're a little bit more, yeah. Right and it's not like I'm intentionally going out and collecting that data, but you can definitely see it um, mm -hmm. as you go. Yeah, it, you know, it's those are some of the things that we've been thinking about after the fact. Like we've got some anecdotal data on some of these other pieces, but it would have been awesome to kind of give get some feedback from them on the front end about, their feelings of self-efficacy and self-esteem and kind of how they felt about school and their connectedness to people at school, like some of those factors. Well, we don't have hard data on that because but we didn't ask for it on the front end. Right? I, I so, think we kind of, we do though, is, mm -hmm. is if we look at the data we have right through our MTSS process, we, we have seen a huge decrease in discipline referrals. Right. And if a student is behind and they're struggling and they don't like school, they're going to communicate that and they're going to communicate that through discipline. And so when you see that 80% of our participants didn't have any ma minor or major mm -hmm. referrals, that's eight out of 10 kids that I would say beforehand <clears throat> had at least a few more write-ups. Right. Um, and, and now they have none. So that, that, I think that does tell mm -hmm. us right there, they're a little bit more happy, a little bit more satisfied with what's going on. They're, they're taking some ownership in, in the process. So even though we didn't intentionally do that, yeah. I would say that just the data there kind of tells us that reduction in discipline referral tells us a lot, I think. Um, so um, I think the, the interesting thing to point out there is that early warning data um, that you're looking at behavior-wise for office discipline referrals um, 
is really kind of founded in that suspension and expulsions. Like that's what you're, that's what you're recording and reporting to the state. Um, but again, we, we've got a system in place because our school is smaller to monitor that on a more detailed um, basis. And so the tracking that I'm doing is like even about the minors, what's, what's going on with our minor write-ups and what sorts of patterns are we seeing there. So that's why we have this listed in here as 80% of the participants did not receive any minors or, or majors. So minors are things that are handled by the teachers but reported in the system. So it never comes to the office. So they're not even having things that are happening in class that a teacher feels like they need to document, which is amazing, right? I mean, it's it's great to see that. So the last piece that we're gonna jump into before we move into- um, One, oh, one asked. thing, uh, there was a comment from the participants that said, this is great. Kids who experience small bits of success will reach more success, which totally. I agree with, yes. Totally. totally. Yeah, it's like, it's that awesome feedback loop that you're wanting, right? That positive feedback loop you're wanting them to get into as they feel some of the, the results of that success, feeling good and putting more into it. Yeah. And if you hear the clunky in the background, just remember we're, our, our temperature outside is about 30 degrees. That's our heating system. So we're, I'm not kicking the table or anything. That is our heating system. Uh, for those of you who are in the 60, 70 degrees, weathers feel a little bit worse for us today because it is cold outside. <laughs> Okay, last piece, because we, we skipped past this, was oh, just that um, this is the only piece of data we're including in this slide that's not a clear start and beginning point, you know, marking period um, to mark, marking period end, start to end, sorry. Um, so kind of where we're at right now, just at the three, week, three weeks into this marking period four, 80% of our participants, so there's 10 now, members, still small group are showing improved academic performance at uh, the three week mark. So that means eight out of 10 are really kind of moving with this intervention. Um, and that goes to what our last our last uh, comment was, right? A little bit of growth leads to more growth mm -hmm. and a little bit of success leads to more success. Yep. Yep, I agree. So. Oh man. Barriers. Okay, let's try to let's try to move through this one pretty quickly because okay. I think um, part of what this really is reliant on is them having the information from the very last slide. Okay. Um, so we wanted to talk with you a little bit about the barriers that we see with this program. For those of you that might consider something like this, might want to take this idea and make it your own in some way. Um, we know that a current barrier for us is attendance um, still. So even though we had 75% um, of the students in this pilot improve their attendance and Collectively as a group, it improved by 8%. We still have some attendance concerns and we have one that's missed over, um, as of when we were compiling this last week, they had missed, um, I don't know, was it almost 70% of the school days so far, you know, so in this marking period. Um, so we're in tough shape to, to um, help them move along when they're not getting here very often. And, so and we have, I know we got to move through this slide a little bit quickly, but I, we do have school-wide initiatives for um, through the MTSS. So we did have one of our teachers. This, this tells you the buy-in for the principals out there and the teachers out there. This tells you the buy-in and the uniqueness and, and the greatness of our staff is we had one staff person said 90% of the students get here 90% of the time. For I'll, the month of March. For the month of March, we had that little March madness, madness. right? Mm -hmm. um, his shave his head. And well, he'll let students shave his head, not even he'll shave his head, he'll let the students shave his head. And we got there, we got there, and the, and the students, they shaved his head, we had a big, you know, we did some YouTube, or uh, Facebook, I don't know all of them, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter stuff, but we do have teachers that do that. And and they had that, and that was, it was amazing to see. So mm -hmm. they actually um, upped it now. So if we get- The goal is has increased. The goal has increased, because it's now gonna deal with me, right? It's 90% mm -hmm. here, 90% of the time, and then, 95 percent have to meet pass all of their classes. pass all their classes then they're allowed to give me a haircut whatever type of haircut they want they said they're going hot pink but i only have to wear it for a week so you might not see me for a week um mm -hmm. but those little things i'm telling you lots of buy-in yeah yeah and that was strategic too right because yeah. we we know we hit a slump in march it's tough up here when we still have so much snow and the weather is kind of terrible during that time of the year. And even though we're heading into spring break, it feels like we can't get there fast enough. 
for a lot of staff and students. The students aren't really feeling it. That's a tough time of the year, February too. Um, so we, we try to do some unique things during that time of the year to keep people's morale up and to try to keep getting them to school. So anyway. Some of the future things um, that we're, we're looking at are anticipating, because we're looking at going school-wide, uh, well, so sixth through eighth, right? That's the reason why our barriers list for the future is quite a bit more expansive, um, is because this, this initiative would look different next year. Yeah, so, so we're going to go six through eighth, um, and we'll we'll talk about those mm -hmm. barriers. We actually can come back to those barriers as we move forward. But our future plans, through our data that we've collected, uh, we see a lot of growth. We see student achievement, and we want to we want to grow this. So we're going to take our sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade. Our sixth grade is going to go forty minutes before lunch, um, and have a flex lab. Our seventh grade and eighth grade is going to go twenty five minutes before lunch, twenty five minutes after lunch. These are scheduled times now for teachers where all teachers on the sixth grade floor, seventh grade floor, and eighth grade floor will be doing a flex lab. They'll have a flex lab home. Students will have a flex lab home. Mm -hmm. They'll build to the kind of go to that, take attendance, get their skyward open, same process, show it to the teacher, do some stuff. The students that are all caught up and able to and, and, and are showing progress and, and don't have um, anything to do, maybe they want to improve their grade. Maybe they want to go from a B to an A. We don't know, and we're not going to set limitations on that. They also can go to things like our flex labs, um, our or sorry, our yes. maker spaces, um, and and our uh, student lounges. And we're going to look at doing some passion projects, um, and and allowing them to kind of lead the project and let them design some stuff. And we've had some, we've had a lot of success with this actually with our after school programs. Right, mm -hmm. we had an entrepreneur after school program this year, um, where. Actually, it kind of mirrored the flex lab, right? If they're not passing their classes, when they come to that after school class, they would have to sit down and get get their homework caught up on. Uh, Mrs. Snyder started this very impressive. Um, and then they'd go into the school store area. And what that is, is uh, you can see it. Uh, you can see a picture of it. But we gave them $4,300, the students $4,300. And you said, go wild. They started a school store. They have cricket machines, uh, laser engravers. They started doing all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, they designed t-shirts. Now they're selling t-shirts for $10 a t-shirt and then have, sweatshirts for $15 yeah, a sweatshirt. We have incredibly reasonable prices oh, because yeah. we wanted it to be affordable for anybody. Everybody, in right? School, Not right. just, we don't want to seclude, you know, a lot of those school, school apparels, like 50, 60 bucks. Well, $15 you, for a sweatshirt yeah. is crazy reasonable. Yeah. And, and it allows us a good pocket to pull from, for our own, um, acknowledgement, kind of rewards that we we offer to students too. We can give them gift certificates to the school store where they can pick their own design and what they want on it. And so we're, we're, we're getting a little too deep into that, but just, just to give you ideas there with this flex lab, we are going to add some other things where kids can really start getting into their, the get into the flex lab idea, but then get into passion projects and get into what they really feel and, and love to do with education. And if you get into that, if you can tap into that, you're going to get kids that really want to be here and really are going to lead. And, and we sell, we sell that, right? This is your school. This isn't my school. They already know that they can replace me like that. They can replace all of us, right? The students aren't going to be replaced. And so this is your school. And, and we've seen a lot of students take ownership in that. And so that's what we're going to use flex lab moving forward. We're going to have the core teachers be available. Um, so students go from classroom to classroom to classroom to get help. And remember, now this is actually structured time. This isn't, we're not asking teachers to give up prep hours or put extra in, although I know they would now. Um, but this is what we're going to do moving forward. And so how do we get teacher buy-in? And I'm going to look, we're going to go back to this slide a little bit. Do you have something to say? You kind oh, of I just was going to say, say um, you know, something I think important to point out is the pilot is a tier two intervention, right? So we are do, using that as a tier two intervention as like a smaller pocket of students we really felt like needed this. Now we're going tier one with this next year, which is why you'll see these other components woven in. Like not everybody's going to need these components that are really um, intentional for this tier two group this year. So how do we make that the best use of time for all students, which is why it's so multifaceted. Um, I don't know if that... I don't know if that helps you, but yeah. so just wanted you to recognize that. And and that, that's very good. Is, is once those students that are all caught up can go out, we we will have the ability to maybe even work with. And this is a just a thought. Um, some more intensive 
um, interventions, um, the tier three interventions, right? Skill development. Skill no, development. Still tier and, two, sometimes tier three. Yes. Yeah. Because we'll do some small group stuff with this time too. So a lot to talk about. Yeah, there's that. a lot. So as you can see that we're still developing, we're still growing. We have a whole summer, so give us some time. Um, so I want to go back to the buy-in real quick. Um, how do you get teachers more comfortable with stepping back? That, that That's going to be a, a barrier. Um, we have teachers that have been here 15, 20 years, uh, maybe even 30 years. They're used to leading it. And they've done stuff that's worked, and that's why they stuck with it. So getting those teachers to pull back a little bit is going to be a little bit more tricky. Um, and so we're, we're working on that. New teachers seem to do whatever they whatever you tell them or, or ask them. You, you didn't really tell them, hey, can we do this? And they say that. Um, so this is, this is something that um, I, we see as a barrier. We also see uh, financially there's some financially barrier. And so actually we're doing an MDE presentation. Please increase our our, our um, money, and 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 we can do a lot of great things. Um, I think that's going to be celebrated. We can't see all the people uh, that are cheering that, but so financially, there's going to be some barriers there, um, and and some of the special skills and stuff we have to bring in. There will be some barriers there, but overall, I think that we have a good plan going forward. We had a we had a question okay. come through. Sarah's, I think, going to help us. So one of the questions was, what types of software or online programs are you considering for content area interventions? And mm -hmm. uh, like you're using Prodigy and what else? Any plans for progress monitoring? Uh, it's just the person said, this is something we're struggling with now, how to consistently progress monitor our interventions. Yeah, so um, I think Lynette will probably be able to speak a little bit, or maybe even Sierra too, about what progress mm -hmm. monitoring might look like on um other levels, because I think that there is a statewide system that we keep hearing is in the works for us to do a little bit more progress monitoring, right? But so you can touch on that because I don't know as much about that. But in-house, it's time consuming. Um, I get why you would be saying that you're struggling with consistently monitoring progress because it takes a lot of legwork and extra time to do it. I've, I've created my own system my own spreadsheets and kind of um, timelines for collecting data and meeting with teams. Um, but I'm, so that's kind of the best description I can give you. I have kind of a massive database that I, I mean, that I would call a da database where I house all of our early warning indicators there, but I also have all these other columns and these progress monitoring markers that I have indicated across the top about when I'm going to be pulling what, when and then another place where I'm hosting who's in what interventions connected to our tier two and tier three team and how is that going for them and, and we also and we also do spread the wealth a little bit too um you know she uses her system I use um, teach link to track mm -hmm. student growth information and discipline uh, information and then we use skyward to really track the grades and what's going on there um, so we have three kind of systems going right now. Mm -hmm. um, and then we we ask for teacher input. And and so that's very big as we have team meetings um, twice a week. And so we're sharing that. We're sharing that as we go forward and, and splitting that up. Not one person can do it. I know that here, um, thank goodness we have Carmen. She's really kept me on track. And then Sierra um, and Lynette, amazing individuals. And when you have that group around you support support yeah. around you you can do a lot of cool things but also we do delegate um and carmen does come in my first couple weeks here okay i'm gonna do this you're gonna do that and we, we have we have broke that up um mm -hmm. and so it has worked yes it is it is work it is very intensive but the outcomes that we've seen just just this year we've reached eight to ten kids so if if, if nothing else is successful just this year, the hard work that was put in has results, and we've seen some great things and we some great turnaround. So, yeah, um, I'll jump in too with the the early warning indicators. I think that's been a source of angst for us too. Um, we collect our early warning indicators three times a year. We have at those data reviews, and and the data coaches come to a separate data coaching support session prior to the data reviews to present that get that data ready to present to their team, but. Um, I, I think that the, I'm hoping the state is on the verge of maybe a more efficient way to collect that data and then also to make it live. But right now, 
Carmen's putting in a lot of elbow grease to get that <laughs> ready um, to keep progress monitoring. And then in, in addition, um, there, some of their reading data with some of their, um, they do some reading interventions at the middle school level, like Read 180. And so that's got some progress monitoring systems built into it as far as tracking their fluency and things. And like NWEA, that. we also use NWEA um, for our, we actually, we went further now this year, we use it for science and we use it for math. Um, and obviously we had a reading inventory for English. And so for social studies, we're looking at NWEA as well. Um, and there's a lot of great data there, but there are a lot of systems out there. I'm not saying you have to use NWEA, but there are things out there for progress, you know, progress monitoring of students, but also just talking to teachers has been very important. And then documenting that when you do have those um, systems and, and, and Lynette and Sierra, you, you came in and said, okay, these groups, you have to have, you know, a note taker and, and we set these groups up, right? You have to have someone in charge and these notes are kept in a Google folder so I can go back and look and it is all very detailed. And so that's a big part of it as well. So between the, the data that Carmen and Tierra and, and Lynette pull out and, and Nora D, our secretary, mm -hmm. and uh, with um, things like uh, we use Skyward and TeachLink, um, NWEA, um, reading inventory stuff, all those things kind of play into it. So I know that's a yeah. long question, but, but or long answer, but. Go ahead, Sierra. One part of that question too was, do you uh, have any specific other software mm -hmm. online programs for your content area interventions? Because I think you mentioned mm -hmm. like inter, uh, reading intervention software and thinking about science reasoning and critical uh, thinking skills. So do you have any thoughts on what you plan to use with those? Well, with our reading, we're doing read 180, right? I mean, that that's the biggest thing. Um, do you know what the math software is that they use for math lab? It's something, there's two actually that we have. I can't think of the names of no, them. I can't off the top of my head either. Um, um, but our, Prodigy and um, it's Prodigy, right? There's a second one yeah. though, because our, our seventh grade math teacher actually wrote a little grant to get um, an additional math software program that she thought would be effective. So she got a certain number of licenses for that for our seventh grade math lab, but I don't know the name of it. Um, yeah, and, and so if you if, if you want to email, email, you, email yeah, yeah. No, if you want to send an email to us, we could ask her. Um, and the most important, I think, we look at you look at software, but the most important thing is like this Flex Lab is not for software. Uh, we're not. I, I, we, we'll have some software there, but it's we want to intentionally build a connection between the student and the teacher um, with that uh, ten by or, or two by ten model. Um, we want to make sure that the teacher is still there to coach and help and assist. So um, software does work here and there, but I worked in a school for five years, a Horizons Alternative. And, and from what I've seen, the students that are in building and working and working with teachers have a, a much higher rate than the students that are working with just software. And we did have just software, students that just work with software like Odysseyware and stuff like that. Um, and so, yes, we will work with that, but most of it is going to go back to the old, I don't, I don't want to say old way, but the, the way of it is teacher, um, student, and and this the, that connection right there, that's what we're trying to build. I, I don't know if this is helpful for them to know or not, but one of the things that we're finding with our NWEA data, that testing data, is that it does give us a really specific description about the skill sets content area that each individual student is lacking where their strengths are and what types of things that they're struggling with. Um, so that helps us be a little bit more targeted too, in terms of what we think um, might kind of lift them up to be um, more in line with grade level content expectations. So NWEA, we, yeah. we're finding that when you drill down into that data, there's a lot of stuff. There is a lot of information available but, to you, but it's not, then there's not a software piece that complements that, right? Which is kind of what you're wondering. And I totally get it yeah. because if you can have a really efficient way to deliver some of the content or skills that you think they're lacking and then an effective way to progress monitor that all within a software program, I and totally I, and understand I, why you would ask. And I, I still want to go back to that. I, I, the most important, I think as we learned from COVID too, is the most important thing is teacher student connection. Um, software is a tool. Um, all these other things are tools, but the most important connection is that teacher student. And that will lead to the most success um, from what I've seen, from what our data shows. And so 
that's that's what the route we're going to go. Not saying that that's going to be something that you yourself, your school, um, is going to go. But for our population in our area, that's that's the most effective. Yeah, we know some of your school districts are going to be huge, right? So it's hard yeah. to think about how to scale that um, this type of an approach in a school that's much larger. Are there any other questions? Um, we do have our emails up on the uh, up on the screen there. Uh, you can email us. Feel free to email us at any time. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for um, for this presentation. It was wonderful. Thank you for all the participants and um, all your questions. If you have any other, please feel free to reach out. They provided their emails. I really, really enjoyed your guys' session and what you're doing. Um, I am just hope we all um, can take some of this forward and really focusing on those connections with our students. Thank you very much. So we're all set for today and hopefully we'll see you soon at another webinar.